My wife and I have always lived a quiet life in the country with our son, Wesley. Our nine-acre property is surrounded to the north and the east by a forest, where Wesley would often go to play with his friends or by himself. For his eighth birthday, I had gone into the forest with Wesley to help him make his own tree fort, where he could stash his comic books, Game Boy, toys, and treasures that he would find while exploring the woods behind our house. He amassed quite the collection of interesting rocks and bugs, which he stored in mason jars, of course, in his forest base, and he spent most of his free time just a few hundred yards away from our house. It was a peaceful life that we had for ourselves. I would take our car into work on the weekdays and bring my wife to town right after Wesley's bus arrived to take him to school. Each day was the same routine, and we all spent the weekends together at the house. In short, we were all very happy. This week is the sixth anniversary of my son, Wesley's, disappearance. To this day, we don't know what happened to him on that brisk autumn evening, but from the moment our 12-year-old son left the house, we had a sneaking suspicion that he was never coming back. On Friday, August 23rd, 2013, our daily morning ritual happened as it always had. I would wake up, eat breakfast with Kim and Wesley, and we would wait together until the bus arrived. Wesley had a half day at school that day, so he would return home before me or my wife were able to get home and watch him. This wasn't a big deal. He was 12 and could look after himself for a few hours. We told him to call my cell phone as soon as he got home after school that day to make sure he was home safely. As Wesley climbed up the stairs onto the bus, my wife began to tremble and eventually break into tears. Neither of us knew what she was crying for, but we waved our son goodbye and both climbed into the car to finish off the work week. My cell phone rang at exactly 12.33 that afternoon. The default ringtone filled the air and I saw that I was receiving a call from our home landline. It must have been Wesley, who had just gotten off the bus and ran into our home, obeying my instructions to call me. When I slid my finger across the screen and answered the phone, the only thing I heard was the empty dial tone of our home landline, as if he hadn't typed out my number yet. I called out his name a few times through my cell, but there was nothing. I tried calling back immediately, but there was no answer. He did as he was instructed, called dad as soon as he got home and must have sprinted out of the door to go play in the woods. I thought nothing of it until I got home. I picked up my wife from the store on the way back to the house. The porch lights were on, which was our family's way of indirectly saying someone's home. Upon entering our house, I called out to Wesley to see if he was in his room. I got no response. So I assumed he was still outside in the woods, even five hours after his call. My kid always loved that fort that I built him. Kim began making dinner, and I changed my clothes and went to the spot in the woods where my son and I had constructed his home away from home. It was starting to get dark, so it was a bit difficult to see through the woods. I spotted the light from his treehouse lamp through his window, and, as any dad should, began silently creeping up the short ladder nailed to the tree to scare the crap out of him. When I reached the top, I quickly swung the curtain door open and let out a roar in an attempt to scare my poor, unexpecting son. However, after scanning the small room, Wesley wasn't sitting in his beanbag chair he normally was. In fact, the chair and his entire collection of rocks, bugs, comics, and games were completely gone off the wooden shelves. The only things in the room were the lit citronella camping lamp that we had given to him when we built the treehouse, 
and a single Skechers sneaker lying in the middle of the room. The shoe was facing the doorway. I walked over to pick it up and examined it in the light of the treehouse lamp. Nothing was unusual about it, but it was Wesley's. I peeked out of the window, wondering where my son could have run off to with only one shoe. The darkness had started to creep over the entire forest, and it would be very dark in no time. I called out into the twilight several times, each with no response. He was probably hiding nearby to scare me, and truth be told, it was working. I was terrified already. I left the lamp on and descended the ladder of the treehouse, continuing to scan the dim area for my son. I called and searched for 30 minutes in the dark, getting no response. I was beginning to panic. Sprinting back in the direction of our home, I noticed that the light in his room was on. A wave of calm and relaxation washed over me. He must have snuck home while I was out here searching for him, little bugger. I opened the back door and entered the kitchen, immediately greeted by my wife asking about the shoe in my hand and where her little Wesley was. I explained what had happened, and she told me he hadn't come home. Once again, the panic in me resurfaced. I sprinted down the hallway to his room and flung open the door. The light to the room was off now, and the interior was completely bare. I know that I saw his light on when I was returning home from the woods, I flipped the light switch on the wall with my right hand, still clutching a sneaker with my left hand. The room was completely empty. His bed, dresser, posters, rug, and bookshelf were completely gone. My wife heard my scream and came instantly rushing to my side. Then she too screamed. We didn't scream at anything we saw, but by the complete lack of something that was before us. Wesley and his possessions were nowhere to be seen, aside from the shoe that I clutched to my chest. Examining it once more in the bare light of his room, a single word had appeared on the sole of his shoe, but only when viewing it in his room. The word didn't appear anywhere else in the house, only his room. The word don't was clearly visible in big black block letters on its bottom. Kim immediately called the police and reported a theft, kidnapping, missing child, breaking and entering, everything. I had already grabbed a flashlight and was combing the woods, looking for any signs of my missing child. The police arrived and I told them everything that had happened. The police helped us search the woods and the surrounding area for hours. We searched for days then weeks, months even. Wesley never returned to our house. Once a week, I would visit his hideout in the woods, which was now overgrown from the months spent untouched, and I left food and water in the hopes that he was hiding somewhere nearby. But the food just sat on the floor, rotting and filling with bugs. The time blended together, and we began to gradually lose hope of ever seeing our boy again. An entire year passed, and I continued to make weekly trips to the hideout just in case he would someday return. August 23rd, Wesley's disappearance anniversary, landed on a Saturday in 2014. I reclined in silent mourning on my love seat while I recalled the events of exactly one year ago. As I sat on the couch, my cell phone rang. The caller ID was our home landline, but I looked over to see our clunky phone set in its home on the dock. No one was using it. The time on the clock next to it read 12.33. I frantically answered the phone, hoping to hear something, anything, but it was just a dial tone. Just like one year ago today. Today, I had brought Wesley's favorite snack, Cheetos and an Arnold Palmer sweet tea to bring to his hideout, but I forgot them on the counter as I sprinted out of the house. It didn't matter. 
I climbed the ladder of the fort and flung the curtain open. It had smelled horrid because of the rotten bread that I had left the last week. But I would take last week's meal back to the house whenever I left. Half expecting to see the bare room as I had every single week following his disappearance. The long burnt out citronella lamp flared on with my entrance, revealing the object sitting in front of me. Wesley's other shoe, once again facing the door. In stunned astonishment, I scooped up the shoe, examining it for another word. Once again, recalling one year ago, I sprinted as fast as I could back to the house. The light of his room was mysteriously on. I dashed past Kim in the kitchen and beelined straight to Wesley's room. I paused for a moment outside the door, noticing that no light was visible under it, the same as it was one year ago. I opened the door as Kim ran down the hall and followed me. She realized what I had discovered, and together we shared the same mixture of anguish and hope as I flipped the light switch on. The empty sole of the shoe now displayed another single word. Father. We looked at each other in silence as tears streamed down our faces. I placed the shoe next to its partner in the center of the room, reading the phrase, Don't bother. Each year since, my wife and I have found another piece of Wesley's clothing in the treehouse. The clues only appeared on August 23rd, after I received the phantom phone call from our house landline at exactly 1233. When I received the call in 2015, I had requested the day off from work. I waited with phone in hand at the bottom of the ladder of the treehouse. As soon as my expected call rang, answered, and repeated the dial tone, I flung myself up the ladder into the treehouse. Same scene as before. Curtain open, light on, and object in the middle of the floor. This time, Wesley's pants lay on the floor, feet facing the door. Grabbing them and sprinting to his room felt all too familiar. I flipped the light on once again and read the next word on them, printed this time on the back of the jeans. This year, the word was looking. August 23rd, 2016. It became tradition for me on these days to miss all other obligations. I wanted to figure out this mystery of my son. The time was 12.32, and I sat cross-legged in the empty hideout, waiting as the seconds ticked by until the inevitable phone call. To my surprise, my phone clock ticked to 12.33, and I received no call. I waited another minute then five, then ten. Giving up, I descended the ladder. Once my feet touched the ground, my phone instantly rang. Home landline. Repeat last year. The curtain, lamp, and object. This year was Wesley's shirt. The same striped, long-sleeved t-shirt I had last seen him in. In his bedroom, I read the next word, printed across the back of it. Four. I already dreaded what the next year would bring. I knew that the next word was going to be him. Some sadistic asshole had kidnapped my son and stole all of his possessions. And now they were toying with me, throwing in my face the fact that I completely failed as a father. August 23rd, 2017. I waited outside the hideout for the call once again. I stood on the tiny deck in front of the curtain until I received the call, but it never came. It seemed that nothing would happen until I was completely on the ground, away from the treehouse. I climbed down the ladder, received the call, and returned to the fort. This time it was Wesley's underwear. This was a bit messed up if you ask me. However, each article of clothing I had received from the fort was completely clean as if it were washed that day. The underwear was no exception. Returning to his room, my hunch upon the next word was completely proved wrong. The word was, me. 
not him. Placing the underwear next to the rest of the clothing, I read the words in order. Don't bother looking for me. Now it's 2018 and my son's disappearance anniversary, if you can call it that, was three days ago. Nothing showed up in the treehouse. No phone calls. No clothing, I checked. Nothing new was added to this puzzle of disappearance. I checked his room last night to see the five pieces of clothing in the room as I did quite often. But they were missing. On the sixth anniversary of his disappearance, all articles of his clothing disappeared. No one could have taken them. I had boarded up the window to Wesley's room and locked the door three times over. Those articles of clothing were the last mementos that my wife and I had of our little boy. And now they have gone missing, too. I'm the kind of guy who will swerve across three lanes of traffic without hesitation because I spotted a sign for a garage sale. Doesn't matter that I don't need anything. Doesn't matter if there are three other people in my car with busy lives and no interest in digging through someone else's trash. Garage sales are like... magical dimensions. Where anything is possible and reality is only a suggestion. Entire sofa for 50 bucks. No problem. They're just happy for someone to get rid of it. Grandpa's medals from the war? Well, who's he trying to impress now, am I right? The literal holy grail. Why not? It's gotta be here somewhere. Some dude's kids were probably eating cereal out of it. But, by far the strangest thing I've ever discovered in years of hunting was a little black notebook bound with leather straps. When I noticed there was writing inside, I snuck behind a big stack of old garden chairs to snoop mercilessly through someone's personal life. The erotic short story of a bored housewife, perhaps. Maybe the daughter's scandalous journal full of young love and heartbreak. It's a garage sale. It's all fair game. I was immediately disappointed upon closer inspection. The first few entries were composed of large blocky letters like a child might write. A day at the pool. The stuff he learned in class. The new friend he met at the park. I was quickly losing interest and was about to return the notebook when I realized I recognized the person he was talking about. Devin was my best friend in third grade. We used to build pillow forts in his parents' house. And there it was. The next entry talking about the fort. About the secret passage we made in the back so his cat could visit when the door was closed. It's been years and years since I last thought about that. But how did these people get my diary? I wasn't even in the same state that I grew up in anymore. I watched the homeowner suspiciously while he bartered over an old TV. Clean face, slightly balding, broad smile, nothing out of the ordinary. I considered asking him about it, but decided it was too personal to explain. I slipped the notebook into my pocket and stood to leave. It couldn't have been stealing if it belonged to me, right? As I headed for my car parked on the street, I heard him call after me. Couldn't find anything you like? I gave him my best straight face and shook my head. Plenty I liked. Nothing I needed. It's hard to tell what you're going to need until we need it. Take care now. I was gone without looking back. Too impatient to drive all the way to my home, I stopped in a small coffee shop around the corner to continue perusing this bizarre discovery. Flipping through the book, I noticed the handwriting slowly refine as it progressed until it identically matched my own. 
This wasn't just a childhood relic. The entry spanned over the course of years. It seemed impossible that I could have kept this for so long without any memory of it. There was no denying it was mine, though, complete with my fleeting obsession over a girl in one of my college classes. I was too shy to talk to her, so I'd just sit in the row behind her and daydream the hour away. She dropped out a few weeks later, and I missed my chance of ever saying hello to her. I was so embarrassed by my ineptitude that I never breathed a word of it about her to anyone. And yet there she was, immortalized on paper in my own hand. So why didn't I remember writing it? The farther I got through the book, the more unsettling that question became. The writing became sloppier, as though rushed. Entries became shorter and far between just a few lines per month. I could still recognize the events of my past, but the language became darker than I was expecting. I should just kill her. Necks break just as easily as hearts, maybe easier. She didn't love me. She can't love anyone but herself. I'd spare the next sucker she decides to screw a lot of pain if I just killed her now. That entry was written about my ex fiance only a few months ago. Yeah, the breakup was stressful for the both of us, but we parted on good terms. Sure, there was some lingering resentment and disappointment, and I had had some pretty nasty thoughts about her, but I'd never consider doing something like that. My diary said otherwise. She gets home late on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It read, 10.30 p.m. at the bus stop. She has two blocks to walk, and there won't be any witnesses around. All I've got to do is take her purse, and it will look like a mugging gone bad. No one will ever know. The next few pages were hard to read. I kept glancing over my shoulder in paranoia as though someone in the coffee shop would read over my shoulder and call the police. I moved to a corner table which had opened up and continued reading. It was even easier than I expected. She didn't look up from her phone, even when I was right behind her. One hand under the jaw, the other on top of her head. One quick motion. I can still hear the splintering crack, like stomping on dry wood except for the wet, sucking sound of separated vertebrae. I stopped reading and looked away. For a second, I thought I remembered what that sounded like, but it might have just been the power of suggestion. I pulled out my phone to text her and make sure she was okay, but changed my mind at the absurdity of it. I flipped ahead to the last page containing writing. It was dated yesterday. It was supposed to be easier this way. I thought killing her would be the end. But I'm thinking about her more than ever. Every face is her reflection. Every smile a sneer. Every voice heavy with accusations. I think I'm going to go insane if I can't get her out of my head. I want to forget. I need to forget. And yet if I do, how much of me will disappear with her? Need to forget. Those words rang a bell in my mind. As I was leaving the garage sale, the man had said it was hard to tell what we're going to need until we need it. It had to be a coincidence. Or maybe I just needed it to be. I scanned every page until the end of the notebook, but they were all blank. I then picked up my phone and called my ex. The ringing seemed to go on for an eternity but it was only three repetitions before it connected. I asked if she was there, my voice catching in my throat. There was crying on the other line, then a sniffled apology. I recognized the voice as her mother's. She's gone, she said. Last week, please don't call again. The call abruptly ended after that. The coffee shop suddenly felt much louder than it had a second ago. 
The sound of the cash register opening made me jump. People seemed to shout at one another across the room. I stumbled outside, and the traffic was a hurricane whirling around me. Then to my car, lurching onto the street with a chorus of horns shaking me to the bone. I didn't slow down until I slammed to a stop at the garage sale once more. All the other prospective buyers had gone home. It was just the homeowner, sitting in an old garden chair facing the street. He wasn't reading or doing anything, just sitting there and waiting. He smiled as though expecting me when I got out of the car. Forget something? He asked, his voice coy. I didn't kill her, I blurted out. I hadn't intended to say that. I don't know what I intended to say, but it wasn't that. He only laughed at me. <laughs> Why not? Because... I'm a good person. We both are. Were. Whatever. It didn't go down like that. How did it go then? He asked, casually reaching under his chair. Like this, maybe? He produced a small stack of notebooks, each a different color. He opened the red one seemingly at random and began to read. Love survives. Love endures. There was once a time when we fought a lot. But in fighting, we learned more about each other than we ever did from the easy times. We showed each other our deepest insecurities and vulnerabilities. We gave the other the power to destroy us. And we loved each other for our mercy. I liked her because of her virtues. But I loved her because of her faults. Because I knew she trusted me enough not to hide herself from me. What is that? I asked. I had been moving closer while he read until I was only a few feet away. You were working on your wedding vows. Don't worry, it's just a first draft. Here, take it. He handed me the red notebook. I snatched it suspiciously, as though the man taking me hostage had just offered me his gun. I immediately flipped to the end and saw my handwriting with yesterday's date once more. One dozen eggs. Diapers. Not that plastic stuff. Garden hose. What the hell is this? Things your wife wanted you to pick up on your way home. You'll find her waiting there for you if you go now. Or maybe you'd prefer the blue notebook. In this one, you never met her at all because you went back to finish your PhD. Is that what you want? Doctor? My face must have betrayed my confusion, because he simply laughed again. A lot of folks think they can only affect their present, because that's all they can see. But every second you're alive, you're only making more of your past. Keep that in mind the next time you make a decision. Is this the past I want to live with someday? He offered me his open hand to take the red notebook back, but I clutched it to my chest. I turned away without another word, gripping the notebook so tightly that the cover cut into my fingertips. I was scared to think of what might happen if I spent any more time here. Besides, my wife was at home, and I didn't intend to keep her waiting. Forever. It was late. I had probably been driving for over ten hours, trying to make it home in Allentown. I've traveled across New Hampshire most of my adult life as a professional truck driver hauling logs, and on most nights I could tell you that I can handle the long hauls from Allentown, Penn State, up to the White Mountains, but bad weather can make you run out of your drive time fast. Typically when that happens, I'll find a shortcut down some of the shorter, narrower roads, roads that 18-wheelers probably shouldn't venture, and cut my time in half. That is what happened when I decided to take a turn on Clear Creek Road. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard the rumors and wondered, is the road really haunted like they say? Well... 
Until last night, I would have told you no. In fact, I have probably taken the road plenty times before and not even thought about it. But this particular night, I knew that my drive time was running out and I would need to find a place to stop for the night. I kept checking the time, wondering if I could get to the next highway before the minutes ran out. But as my heavy wheels kept clogging on the road, I knew that wouldn't be possible. That's when I saw a neon sign shining in the darkness. Mel's Meals, open 23 hours a day. A rest stop? Way out here? I had never seen a rest stop on this road before. There was another truck there already parked, and I could almost smell the food coming out of the diner. The GPS told me it was another 20 minutes before my next turn. Something didn't feel right, but I was so tired. I decided that if someone else had decided to stop there, then it must be safe. I activated my air brakes, screeching to a halt, and grabbed my big 72-ounce cup I bought a while back and checked the time. 7.13 p.m. I knew it was much later than that. Had to be. It was so dark outside. I made my way towards the diner, and then looked at the other trucker that had pulled in to catch a night's rest. I didn't recognize the logo on the side of the truck. The truck itself looked old and rusted, like it had been built in the 80s. As I was making my way past it, I heard a sound that made my heart skip a beat. The entire trailer shuddered and boomed and shook inside. I heard this loud screeching noise like massive claws against the metal as I backed away and looked towards the cab. Suddenly, a man wearing a full bodysuit exited the cab and moved towards the trailer with something glistening in his right palm. It appeared to be an electric cattle prod. My mind raced as I watched him unlatch the trailer and climb inside. I heard more shrieks, the rattling of chains, and the loud shock of the cattle prod zapping whatever it was inside. Then, he climbed back out and latched the door back up. He didn't seem to notice me at all, and placed the electric weapon back in his cab before climbing in and shutting the door himself. I wasn't about to approach him and ask what that was all about. In fact, if I still had remaining drive time, I would have left right then and there. But our trucks are monitored by the company I work for, and any sort of violation like that would put me out of work without question. So I mustered up some courage and walked inside the diner. As I expected, it was almost entirely empty save for one waitress and a cook, whom I caught a glimpse of in the small window to the rear. A bell jingled softly on the door as I walked in, and a spunky blonde waitress smiled cheerfully towards me. Evening, Hoss. Welcome to Mel's Meals. I'm Cindy, she said excitedly as she trotted off to get a menu. But when I looked at it, the brochure actually seemed unnecessary. Something wrong? Cindy asked as she smacked some bubblegum. There's only one item on the menu, I pointed out. How special. I was starving, so I ordered it and asked for a cup of coffee. Then I heard that familiar jingle and saw another man walk into the diner. At first, I thought it would be the spandex-loving driver I had just seen, but this man didn't look familiar to me at all. He was wearing cowboy boots that made soft clinks on the tile floor, and a biker jacket and an outback hat. He took a look at me and I nodded. With a get-up like that, you sure stand out like a sore thumb, I told him. He didn't even bother to make a response to me and just shimmied over to the bar, taking off his hat, and then asked in a gruff voice for a cup of coffee. I glanced out towards the parking lot, but still noticed that there were only two trucks. Where did this guy come from? I checked the clock on the wall, surprised again to find that it hadn't changed a minute since I got there. Enjoy some hash browns while we cook up your order, hun. They're on the house, Cindy said, placing a plate in front of me. They had arranged my hash browns to look like a smiley face. I made a little chuckle and began eating. 
The food was surprisingly good. The music was a tad off, but I was starting to relax for just a minute when the cook came out carrying a large silver platter with some meat on it. It was still sizzling so loud that I could hear it as he put it down in front of me. First time here? He asked me. I noticed he had a tattoo on his arm, consisting of three letters, and I said to him, Was Mel your wife? Sister, actually, he said. Ran this diner for years before she gave me the keys to the kingdom, he said, wiping some grease from his face. See a lot of business? I asked, looking about. Besides the cowboy and I, the place was pretty deserted. Nah, you know how rumors spread in a place like this, he said with a slight chuckle. He appeared to be very friendly, and the food looked so good I couldn't say no. He walked back into the kitchen, and I reached for my fork to chow down. Then, I felt a strong grip on my shoulder, and looked up to see the cowboy standing over me. Need something? I asked him. You don't want to be here, he whispered at me. Excuse me? I said, looking at him in the eyes. Put your silverware down, pick up your keys, and leave this place, he said. He was staring straight towards Cindy. No, not to her, but to the clock right behind her head. It still hadn't moved past 7.13. Sorry, buddy, I know you probably mean well, but I'm not going anywhere tonight, I told him as I reached for my fork again. The bell jingled again before I could take a bite. This time, the man in the bodysuit was entering, and he didn't look happy. He was pacing around the doorway as Cindy walked up to him. Don't let him fool you, the cowboy said as he released his grip on me and shuffled his way back to his seat. The waitress and the newcomer were having what seemed to be a heated discussion that I could only pick up bits and pieces of above the music. Not now. This came too early. Shipments. Supply and demand. Then I heard that noise again. Louder than ever before. Coming from the trailer outside. It sounded as if it was coming from hell itself. This time I dropped my fork. As it clattered to the floor, Cindy gave me a half smile. Sorry to disturb you, sir, just talking shop, she said aloud to me, and then glared back at the spandex man. He actually looked downright hilarious wearing that suit in here, and I was too intrigued to eat. He walked back towards his truck, and I watched out of the corner of my eye as several workers seemed to emerge from the darkness behind the diner to his trailer door. They all had chains and long cattle prods just like he had used earlier. They were moving whatever was inside to the back storage room. I pretended to get up and get a refill and walked straight towards the cowboy, sliding right beside him to whisper. What's in the trailer? I asked. Leave. Get out of here now, he said. His voice was stern, but it sounded as if he was almost begging me to go. The shrieking and scratching I heard earlier was now coming from inside the kitchen. Then I heard a new sound. The sound of a grinding saw. I could hear it cut into flesh and bone. When that happened, I dropped my glass. It shattered on the floor around my feet. I looked at the cowboy. His eyes were whiter than a sheet. The door to the kitchen opened and the cook leaned out with blood covering his face and apron. I didn't have to be told what to do this time. I made a break for the door and ran through the dark parking lot. I was panting like an Olympic sprinter. I grabbed a hold of the side of the truck and then looked towards the back. The doors were still open. I froze as I heard more growls coming from inside the trailer. I reached into my pocket and retrieved my pocket knife before walking towards the door. My truck was only 30 feet away right on the other side of this one. I kept my eyes on the shimmy door at all times, using my phone to illuminate the darkness around me and see what was on the other side. It was completely pitch black. I could hear the snaps and the yelps. I stumbled towards my door and climbed into my cab. When the headlights came on, I saw exactly what they were hauling inside. 
gray, scaly skin, long, wretched tails with bones protruding out of the sides. But they had a face and chest like a man. They looked towards me with pleading eyes. I pressed down on my air brakes and backed away. They struggled against their chains louder as I saw the cook look towards the road. I didn't stop until the diner was well out of sight. Not until morning broke over the horizon. I haven't slept a wink. My hands are still shaking even as I try to write this. I know pretty soon I will have to call my boss and explain why I went against DOT regulations. I'm not sure what I'm going to tell them. But I know I won't be taking any shortcuts in the near future. My father died in 1995. For years, I thought he might still be alive. It's not that strange. A lot of young children struggle to understand the confusing concept of death. How can someone be here one day and gone the next? Maybe the finality of it all struck me the most. I convinced myself that Dad only went away for a little while. The priest who spoke at the service filled my head with the misguided idea. He seemed like a nice guy. He shook my hand hard and held my mom while she cried. At the end of the wake, he talked to the guests about my father's life. He mentioned Dad's time in the military and how much he loved his family and how much he loved basketball. Then, he ended with one final line. Someday, we will all be reunited with Timothy. Amen. I thought about that part a lot. In my baffled adolescent mind, something about those words made sense. Just in all the wrong ways. The whole experience never felt real. Dad had promised to take me to Disney for my 10th birthday. He promised to take me to a bar on my 21st. We had plans. Dad would come back. He always did. Who would walk my sister down the aisle? Who would be there at graduation? How could someone so crucial to my existence just... disappear? I told myself the priest had to be right. Dad was around. We just needed to find a way to see him again. In the weeks that followed, phone calls and visits from extended family members and friends started to flicker out. My mother went back to work. My brother and sister went back to college. Our family routines became abandoned. Holidays turned into a hassled chore at best, and we never really went on vacations again. Most days it was just me at home, alone with a basketball hoop and a brick wall. I read about death a lot on the internet. Some people said there were ways to see the dead. Some people said they were always with us, but nobody had much information on how to bring them back. I checked everywhere. Most websites talked about the dangers of reanimation and the reasons why it was a bad idea. I ignored them and continued looking. Eventually, Months after the funeral, I found the answer to my questions. The website called itself fixyou.org, and I can still remember the neon lettering and corny graphics on my crappy computer monitor. The site had two tabs, incantations and contact. I clicked the former and waited about 20 minutes for it to load up on our dial-up internet. Red text appeared after a moment. FixU employs both technology and spell work to enable communication between living souls and the dead. All information is to be used with extreme caution. Please view the next page to see if you qualify for disclosure. I clicked past the warning without even hesitating. The following page showed a form requesting my name, age, and address. 
I entered all the information in and clicked next. A green check mark appeared. I guess I met the requirements. Fix you requires a specific object to be cursed. This object should have a specific connection to both the individual conducting the spell and the individual who has passed away. Please locate it before continuing. I looked down and picked up my basketball and scrolled down the page. My dad taught me the infamous family hookshot just two months prior. Repeat the following words six times aloud. Hold the object and spin it once for every repetition. The phrase seemed to be Latin. I struggled through the pronunciation and did as told. It felt weird, but it's not like anybody was home to judge me. Sergei Lazarum, Desere Lazarum. Nothing happened. I said the phrase 16 times exactly. I searched for a non-existent next button on the website, as frustration built up inside me like a powder keg. Now what? I shouted aloud to my empty room. The website seemed to respond to me. I didn't click anything, and yet the page refreshed. That seemed pretty crazy to a young kid on the internet in those days. A cartoonish genie with a word bubble displayed on the screen. Tonight, you will dream about your loved one. Think about them as much as possible. Hold the object close. If the spell is done correctly, and the individual would like to communicate, you will make first contact in your dreams. I followed the instructions and tucked myself into bed at 9 o'clock. Excitement replaced frustration. I clutched the basketball harder than I ever had before. I thought about all the best times with my father. At the park. At the mall. At the movies. That night, when I fell asleep, I did dream about him. I dreamed that Dad lived in a cabin somewhere out in the woods. I visited on a dark, rainy night, and he explained everything once we got inside. My mom and him had gotten into a fight, apparently. She just didn't want him around anymore. He had to hide from the government, and nobody could know where he lived. Death never even became a topic of conversation. It felt too ridiculous to even suggest. Dad sat right in front of me. I told him about school, and the upcoming summer, and everything that was going on in my life. He just smiled and listened. Then he made me dinner. And then, as suddenly as the dream started, it ended. I woke up in a cold sweat and cried for an hour. The horrible teasing effect of the whole situation was the worst part. It seemed so real. He looked exactly the way I remembered. I wondered whether or not it was the website that made me dream about him. Doubt left my mind as the memories walled up in my head. We just needed some more time. I rushed back to the old computer in my bedroom immediately after breakfast. I loaded up fixyou.org and waited for the dial-up modem to connect. When it did, I nearly fell off my chair. You have completed level one of contact. At two o'clock Tuesday morning, wait outside the address given. Bring your cursed object. At that time, a chariot will arrive. You will be able to make contact with your loved one on the living plane. I bit my lip through the whole weekend. In retrospect, I should have told my mother, but the story seemed too unbelievable. I knew she would just take away the computer the second she heard it, and that could not happen. I could not live wondering whether there was a way to see my father again. My alarm woke me up at 1.45 on Tuesday morning. That gave me enough time to change out of my PJs and slip outside through the back door. It was cold that night. Bits of white snow slipped down from the sky in what must have been record time. An oncoming blizzard that would cancel school for the next day. That only added to my excitement. I could not wait to tell Dad. Maybe he could stay over for the day. 
I shivered in my father's boots while waiting on the front porch. I hoped they'd still fit. I thought he might need them, wherever he was going. So many questions flooded my mind. I made sure to remember all of them. We would not be dreaming this time. Who knew when we could talk again? Then, I heard the squeal of shaky brakes and snow crumpled under tires at exactly 2 a.m. The street sat about 20 feet in front of our house. A flash of blue stuck out between the hallowed trees and white waves of sleet. A van slowed down as it approached our house. And then it stopped. I looked around. I stared for a minute or two. Nothing seemed to move. Something about the situation started to feel... uneasy. Could the dream have been a coincidence? Then, a door to the van opened. The quietness of the snowstorm seemed to add to the eeriness. A white light somewhere inside illuminated an empty, quiet cabin. I wondered whether Dad sat in the back or in the front. Was he driving? Where should I sit? I made my way towards the car. The hill in front of my house was perfect for sledding and not much else. I slipped a couple of times going down. On the second or third tumble, I heard another van door open. Then, my mother's shrill voice pierced the night. Matthew! Oh my god, no! Matthew, get back in the house this instant! The next few moments were a shock for all parties involved. The white light turned off inside the van. The door slammed shut. The driver slid down the street like a burglar leaving a crime scene at the sight of my mother flying out of the house and screaming like a banshee. After yelling, screaming, cursing, and calling the police, she finally asked me what the hell happened. I told her everything. I told her about FixYou.org. I told her about my dreams and my plan to meet Dad and talk to him one last time. She looked terrified. You see, there was a story on the local news that night. Several children in the area had recently been abducted. The newscaster said they did not have much information available as of yet. The police had not even narrowed down a list of suspects yet. The only lead cops had at the time still gives me the feeling of ice water running down my spine. The individuals all lured the young victims away online. Three months. It's been three months and not a single good night's sleep. Is that even a possible feat? The record has been 11 days and 25 minutes for decades, held to this day by Randy Gardner. But sleep is not simply the act of falling unconscious at night. Sleep is so much more. Our brains spend nighttime going through several cycles, arguably the most important one being REM sleep, which is when we experience dreams. Whether they are memorable or not, they are necessary. Without REM sleep, our minds will slowly fall apart over weeks and months until the brain simply shuts down. Oh, how I miss the sweet bliss of a dream. Hell, I'd even take a lifetime of nightmares over this constant torture. You see, I suffer from an extremely rare condition called Fatal Familial Insomnia. And, as badass as that name sounds, I can assure you it's anything but. With this disease, I am unable to dream, and only light sleep will ever be achievable for me. As far as insomnia goes, this is the lethal kind that slowly, but effectively, is turning my brain into Swiss cheese. By the end of this year, I will be dead. Spare me the pity. Spare me the words of consolation. I've had a good life, and I've come to terms with my fate. 
I will meet my maker soon, but I fear I have to pay for a terrible mistake I've made. About a week into my diagnosis, the lack of proper sleep was already a heavy burden on my mental and physical health. In my peripheral vision, I started to see blurry figures moving around, even when I was supposedly alone. Hallucinations are one of the main expectations from my disease, but they persisted even while I took my medication that was meant to suppress the symptoms. I quit my job quickly after my diagnosis. Due to my life insurance, I was paid a neat sum of money that could keep me in a comfortable lifestyle for the few months I had left, so I spent my remaining time researching. You'd be surprised how many people attempt to stay awake for days at a time, simply for the hallucinogenic experience. They even have large forums dedicated to just that. These forums are where I first learned about the dark dimensions or alternate realities beyond our own world that we can only see as our minds break down. Robert Holtz, one of the members, wrote, Our minds are incredible creations that allow us to experience the world around us enjoying the emotions provided by chemical interactions with our brain. We love. We learn. We live. Our minds also function as a filter, protecting us from things beyond our comprehension. But these filters deteriorate as we get tired, which is why we need sleep. Without this nighttime habit, the walls between us and the dark dimension start to break down, and you can truly see everything that exists out there. Ever seen something standing by the foot of your bed just as you fall asleep, only for it to disappear when you wake up from the resulting surge of adrenaline? That's one of them. One of the shadow people. Now, I figure that since people normally can't stay awake for more than a few days at a time, they can never truly appreciate the horrors that emerge from the dark dimension. Since I hadn't experienced deep sleep for about two weeks at the time, the blurry figures finally started to become more clear. The shadow people are everywhere. And mostly, they simply just observe us, following people around while studying them for whatever reason. They almost never interfere. On the rare occasion that they do, however, nothing good happens. Times when people suddenly fall over dead in the street without a known cause. That's them. Since they were mostly just there, I didn't decide to follow them until one month into my diagnosis. I noticed one crossing the street. A tall, lanky shadow walking with slow but determined steps. I started to pursue it due to morbid curiosity. What was it doing? What would it do? A man walking down the street, blissfully unaware of the shadow. He was in his early fifties wearing a tailored suit. The creature walked behind the man, seemingly intrigued. This went on for a few minutes, until the creature slowly reached out its thin hand towards the man. It touched him on his shoulder, softly like a feather falling from the sky. And then the man fell forward to the ground, clutching his chest. I'm not a doctor, but I've taken enough CPR courses through various occupations to know what a heart attack looks like. I instinctively pulled my phone out to call an ambulance, before I ran over and began chest compressions. It felt like an eternity passed as I kept pushing down on his chest. The ribs cracked under the force of my hands, while my muscles burned and strained. When the ambulance finally arrived, I was drenched in sweat. The paramedics came running to bring the man into the ambulance. One of them took my name and number before jumping into the back and shutting the doors. Just as he did, I caught another glimpse of the man I had helped. There was something familiar about his face. By the time my surge of adrenaline wore off, the creature was already gone. 
A day later, the hospital called to thank me for my efforts. He had miraculously recovered and would be able to live for several more years, all thanks to me. The event filled me with a longing to make a difference. Over the next month, I started following the shadow people around. They were everywhere, but only a few of them moved around in a purposeful manner. Those were the ones I knew would strike. A young man, no more than 25, managed to crash his car. There was no discernible reason why he had swerved off the completely straight road, but the resulting wreckage was pretty bad. I managed to get him out of the car just in time, before the gas tank ignited and the car drowned in a blazing inferno. The shadow that had seemingly pushed the car off the road had taken notice of me. For a moment, I stared into its empty face, and at that moment I knew they were fully aware of my ability. The man I saved was, luckily, uninjured from the incident, and I left straight after I had called emergency services. A few days later, I saved another man. He had fallen out of the third floor of his office building, no one save for myself to notice. The fall broke a few of his ribs which subsequently punctured both of his lungs, but because I was quick enough to call for help, he was saved. I looked up at the window he had fallen from. Another shadow person stood there. Despite having no face, I knew it was staring at me, judging me for interfering with their kills. Days and weeks passed, and I quickly lost count of all the people I had saved. But my body could hardly keep up the effort as my disease progressed. Soon, it would succumb to pure exhaustion, and there was nothing I could do about it. My determination was beginning to fade. The news just happened to be on one day. Quite frankly, I couldn't even remember turning on the television. Forgetfulness and memory loss had become a faithful enemy in my disease. A familiar face appeared on the TV screen. It was the first person I ever saved, the man who suffered a heart attack on the street. His name was Samuel Walker, and he had apparently been on the news for the past few months after being linked to several murders, two of which he committed before his trial, after I had saved his life. I sat motionless and stared at the man. Was it really him? Had I saved him and thus allowed him to kill more innocent people? Did they know? What else could I do but to research each person I had saved? The man I pulled from the car wreck went home to murder his girlfriend after I saved him. She would have lived if not for me. Each person I had saved was a violent criminal. A murderer and each went on to commit horrible acts after I saved them. They knew. I had been defeated. In my quest to do good, I had committed a horrible mistake, one that had resulted in the ending of lives of innocent and good people. After the horrifying realization, I gave into my disease. I didn't leave the house for days. I only drank until I passed out which to me was nothing more than darkness. No dreams to escape to. No alternate reality. Taking my life was an option frequently crossing my mind. It would be so easy to simply give up and face the consequences. But I was not alone. I opened my eyes and noticed something. A group of shadow people were now standing around me. How had I not noticed them before? Were they there to punish me, take me over to their dimension? No. They just stood there. I can't explain what happened, but we communicated. Not with words, not with thoughts, we just had an understanding. Do not interfere with their business. As grotesque and immoral as it might seem, their actions are necessary to balance out the evils of this world. After feeling those words, in the blink of an eye, they were all gone. I had been given a second chance, although that only meant a few more months on this earth. A few more months that I intend to use.
to undo my mistakes. I'm not really sure where to begin, as I'm not much of a writer, but I'll try my best. My name is Jack, and I grew up in a small town just outside Indianapolis. My father was a decent, hardworking man. He was a factory worker most of his life. He always liked to joke around with me, pointing to different cars driving by and saying, Hey, did you know I built that one? It was fun for the first hundred times, but he was relentless. My mother, on the other hand, she was a banker. She liked to joke that she was a millionaire, but only at work. My parents were a match made in heaven, I suppose. Growing up, my life was as cookie-cutter as life could be. I didn't have a lot of friends, just a few close ones who I hung out with constantly. I never got into any trouble, never did drugs, and never missed a day of school. I was that perfect child parents always dreamed of having. While some of my friends did get themselves into mischief sometimes, I was always that kid who never went with them. Sure, it cost me some friendships, and people eventually stopped inviting me to do things, but none of that really mattered to me. After graduating high school, my father wanted me to go into the factory business, but I was never very good with manual labor. I was more of a technical guy. Hand me a computer over a wrench any day. Even though he was mildly disappointed at hearing this, he was still very supportive. I went to college and got a bachelor's degree in accounting. To some of you, that might sound as the stupidest degree someone could get. But for my whole life, I've always been good with numbers. And there's always a need for someone to process those numbers. Someone may look at it and see stupid. I look at it and see job security. Though, I must agree, my job is extremely boring. Not long after graduating college, I had a job offer from a corporation in the city, processing audits and the like. It wasn't a very good job, and the long hours made me cringe, but the pay was great. That's what it all comes down to in the long run, I guess. Money. I accepted, and for the better part of the last six years, I've been working there. My life hardly got more exciting after I started working there. The most exciting thing I've ever done was move into a house. It was a really nice place. Cozy. And on the complete opposite side of the city from my job. Commuting to work and back was nightmarish, but there wasn't much else I could do. So every day, every single day, for years, I would wake up extra early in the morning, shower, shave, get dressed, drink coffee, and drive 45 minutes to my mundane job. Every single day for two years straight, this repetition has been my whole life. Then, one day, something happened. It was an overcast morning, and for some reason my alarm didn't go off. So right from the very beginning, I was already having a pretty crappy day. As I scrambled to get ready, I nicked my chin with my razor and I spilled coffee all over my brand new shirt and tie. I dashed outside, threw my briefcase into my car, started it up and drove away. For about three minutes. The horrendous clunk under the hood of my car rattled the interior, and I felt my heart sink with each thud. Shortly after, my car came to a rolling stop only a few houses away from my own. I rested my head on my steering wheel, regretting ever getting out of bed this day. As I resigned myself to walking to the bus stop, I stepped out of my car and onto the sidewalk. Just as I did, a young boy came running past me. He tripped on the pavement and landed face first on the concrete. Shocked, I ran over to the boy and helped him up. His face had minor scrapes on it, and I asked him if he was alright. It was then that he said something to me, and it's the reason I'm writing this story in the first place. The look in the boy's eyes were vacant, like he was in some sort of trance. It was as if he were looking through me. He said, Four years from today, your death will come. 
I could only blink in response as I stared at the boy. A moment later, who I assumed was his mother came rushing out of a nearby house. She gave me an accusatory glare, and it was at that moment that I realized I was a grown man holding and talking to a small boy who wasn't my son. I quickly backed away and told the mother that he tripped and I was helping him up, though that didn't seem to make things better. I apologized to her and walked away. But then the boy said another thing that gave me a moment of pause. He said, Goodbye, Jack. I froze in mid-step. When I looked over my shoulder, the boy looked to his mother, smiled, laughed, and ran off back towards his house. Entering my own house, I called my work and requested some time off. They didn't mind as I had never even taken a sick day up until now. I spent a few weeks racking my brain on how that boy knew my name and what he had said earlier. Then, I spent another few weeks trying to just forget the whole incident ever happened. I wrote that day off as just a really bad day and tried to put it behind me. Over the years since, my life once again resumed its mundane repetition. I take that back. I did get a promotion at my job, so I was now head supervisor of the accounting department, which was just a fancy title for slightly more pay and even more outrageous work hours. Three years is quite a long time, and had you asked me about that day, I probably wouldn't have fully remembered it. That was until last month. I was awoken in the middle of the night. There was no reason for my sleep to have been disturbed, as I heard no sounds and saw no one around me. I just opened my eyes at 3 a.m., fully awake. I got out of bed to get a glass of water from the kitchen. While I gulped down the glass... Something caught my eye through the kitchen window. It was only for a moment, but it looked like somebody was standing outside my house. In the dark. I called the police simply because it was better safe than sorry. The operator told me they would send a car up and down my block, but that was the best they could do unless something else happened. I thanked them and hung up. I went back to bed without issue. And the next morning, while I sipped my coffee, I went to check for my morning paper. That's when I saw it. A letter, taped to my door. It only said one thing. Your time is almost up. Standing there, I could barely hear my mug shatter on the ground. Instantly, I was brought back to that day with that kid. And what he had said to me. A thousand questions raced through my head. Was the kid still messing with me? Was this just some sick joke? Why would someone make a joke go on this long? I backed away from the door and checked my calendar. Even though I previously had trouble remembering the whole ordeal, with this sudden jog of my memory, I remembered the day specifically. It was only one month away. Ever since receiving that notice, I've called the police and reported it as a death threat though I couldn't understand why anyone would target me. I've never done anything remarkable in my life. I've never hindered or hurt anyone. I've never let myself get close enough to anyone to hurt them. The police told me once again there wasn't much they could do, and I hated them for telling me that. The, the last few weeks after receiving that letter has been mental hell for me. I can hardly sleep. I don't leave my house for any reason. I know it's probably just a hoax, but I can't shake the what-if from my mind. I've called my family and remaining friends, telling them all how much I love them. I've written out a will, though I don't even own that much, so it's probably not that important. I told my job that I needed some more time off, though I can tell they're getting antsy over me missing so much work. Tomorrow is supposedly the day. Looking back on my life, I've done absolutely nothing with it. I've never traveled. I've never had a relationship lasting longer than a few months. I've never experienced a whole lot of new things. I never lived. If I'm right and my last day on earth is tomorrow, I will die with so many regrets. 
But if I'm wrong and I survive, there is so much I plan on doing. My advice and potential last words to every single one of you listening to this. Live. Live your lives as if they were going to end very soon. Explore the world. Fall in love, fall out of love. Eat new foods. And be the best person you can be. If not, you might regret it. Just like I do. I don't know what that boy was. Or if I had wronged someone in the past. But I just want to say... If I don't survive tomorrow, then I am sorry. Sorry for not cherishing life as much as I should have. Myself, my wife Kimmy, and our friends Ryan and Alyssa, also a couple, decided to all go camping together. It was going to be a four-day trip. We'd hike for a day, sleep for the night, hike the next day, sleep, and then turn around and take the same way back. We did our research to make sure it wasn't an Indian burial ground or anything like that. That no one had died there, as far as we could tell. That there weren't any Bigfoot sightings. Pretty much everything to ensure our safety from at least otherworldly things. Because, I don't know, you can never be too careful. We left on a Wednesday and drove to the campsite, got our parking pass, and got all set up to go. We had chosen a more difficult trail to go on, as we were all relatively experienced hikers, although this would be the first multi-day hiking trip any of us had ever taken before. The campsite was around five hours from the town in which we lived, in an area with dense, tall trees. We got there about 9 a.m. and prepared for our first day of hiking. Going through the hills of the wilderness we had chosen was downright cathartic. Though I was physically exhausted, being in nature that raw and seemingly untouched was almost therapeutic and certainly relaxing. After about 11 hours of hiking, we were losing daylight, so we decided to stop to set up camp for the night. Ryan and I got a fire going and set up our tents while the girls cooked hot dogs over the fire. We sat around for a while, eating, talking, laughing, and hypothesizing what the following day was going to bring us. At around 11 p.m., we decided to all call it a night and headed to our tents. Though exhausted from the hiking we had done all day, I couldn't bring myself to fall asleep. I laid there for a while, listening to the sounds of the outdoors that surrounded us. Cicadas and crickets chirped, trees blew in the wind, and in the distance, animals roamed the land they call home. It wasn't until after I had fallen asleep that a noise was made that woke me up one that I knew wasn't natural. The initial noise woke me up and I was at full alert immediately. I sat, my ears perked up, halfway sure that there hadn't been a noise at all and that I had just dreamt of the disturbance. That was until I heard it again. It was the sound of leaves and twigs crunching on the ground. Naturally, my first thought was that it was some kind of animal so I used my cell phone to call Ryan, who answered on the first ring. He had heard the noise too. We both agreed to meet outside of our tents with our flashlights the next time we heard the noise. The first time, the noise had been relatively distant. The second time, it was much, much closer. It was within the area we had allotted ourselves to camp. I readied my hunting knife, and with the mostly silence that surrounded us outside, I was able to hear Ryan do the same in his tent. At that moment, more leaves and twigs crunched in what I assumed was the animal's footsteps. This time, they sounded closer to Ryan's tent. By this point, Kimmy was awake and afraid. 
I assured her that nothing was wrong. Just a wild animal and she had nothing to worry about. Ryan and I were going to take care of it. I heard Ryan begin to slowly unzip his tent, which prompted me to do the same. My tent was open just enough so that I could get a decent view of the area in front of our tents. Nothing seemed out of place. The fire pit we had constructed was as we had left it, ember smoldering quietly as the rising smoke was whisked away in the wind. Another footstep sounding noise once again broke the tranquility of the night. This time, it sounded as if they were coming from directly between our two tents. I heard Ryan quickly finish unzipping his tent and jump out to confront whatever animal it was outside our lodging for the night. And I did the same. There we stood, knives in hand, with nothing in front of us besides our tents and significant others. There was no animal. Nothing out of the ordinary. We took a brief stroll around the area we were in, and found nothing of concern. It was when we were just about to head back into our tents that I noticed it. I didn't know what made me notice it at first, as it was, admittedly, quite unremarkable. But in the little moonlight that shined through the towering trees, I saw the reflection off of them. A pair of eyes. A pair of eyes looking back at me from probably 25 yards away. I whispered to Ryan to look out there, and gave him the best description of where to focus his gaze to see them. To my surprise, he found another set. This one was looking at him. As the seconds slowly ticked by, the two of us noticed more and more sets of eyes, all of them white staring back at us. New sets began opening as we surveyed the woods, horrified at what lied, seemingly in wait beyond the trees. Ryan and I looked at each other, unsure of what to do, but knowing that keeping our significant others safe was top priority. Then the eyes began to move. In almost perfect unison, every set of eyes we could see and all the new ones that would open began swaying back and forth, back and forth, so slowly. If it weren't for the pure darkness the bright white lights were set against, we probably wouldn't have noticed the movement. But they were, moving, ever so slightly, and after a short time we began to see what looked like the eyes getting bigger. Only they weren't. They were getting closer. At this point, we had to tell the women what was going on. They were understandably very frightened at what we were telling them, and that fear wasn't alleviated at all when they stepped out of the tents and saw the swaying eyes in the darkness. We looked around us in every direction, and the eyes completely surrounded us. I don't know what I was more afraid of. The eyes, or the fact that I had no idea who or what the eyes belonged to. After what seemed like an hour, the swaying eyes began disappearing, one pair at a time. They had gotten within roughly 15 feet of us, and at that point, they began slowly moving backwards. Our attention had been so focused on the eyes closing in on us, that we didn't even notice that the sun was beginning to rise east of us. After about 15 minutes, there were no eyes in sight anymore. We immediately began packing our things and began heading back the way from which we had come, deciding that whatever had terrorized us the night before had sufficiently done enough psychological damage to us to cut our trip short. It was about eight hours into our trip back to the car that we reached an area none of us recognized. This, of course, didn't make any sense, as we had taken the same trails back that we had taken out there. None of us had service on our cell phones. The area we had camped at the night before was much higher up than where we were now, so we couldn't call for help. We were all collectively worried, but still determined to get out of those woods. More hours went by, and we hadn't the slightest clue where we were. Even following our compass, 
It was as if more land had been added to the woods overnight, which of course was impossible. The moon eventually replaced the sun, and we were forced to set up camp for the night. We got a fire going and Ryan and I decided to take turns sleeping, just in case whatever the eyes were came back. I stayed up first and saw nothing. A while after I went to sleep, Ryan woke me up. I came out of my tent and was taken aback by the countless sets of eyes that were staring at me from within the darkness of the woods. Unlike the previous night, these eyes hadn't gradually appeared. Ryan said that when he locked eyes with one pair, the rest of them appeared. There must have been hundreds. All different heights. Some looked as if they were laying on the ground. Others were in the trees. They never blinked. Once they were open, they stayed open. It was shortly after I got outside and woke the girls up that the eyes began swaying again. Though they swayed at the same time, they got closer to us much quicker. Ryan, the girls, and I all stood with our backs to each other, each armed with a hunting knife, no one sure of what exactly we were dealing with. All of a sudden, we heard that sound of leaves and twigs crunching, but it was happening rapidly, and they were getting closer. It sounded like whatever it was had run right up next to us and stopped. Then Alyssa let out a scream. We looked at her, and her eyes were fixed upon her own tent. In the darkness that filled her tent, the flap of which was open, sat a set of eyes looking out at us. Ryan yelled out to whatever they were to stop messing with us, but that obviously didn't do anything. We began hearing the footsteps, the cracking of leaves and twigs all around us spontaneously, like these creatures were running around us in the darkness. Whatever they were, they were fast. The one in the tent just sat there, swaying back and forth. It was the closest any of them had gotten to us. We were still unable to see what these things were, what the eyes belonged to. None of us had the courage to go back into our tents, surely not Ryan and Alyssa's, to grab a flashlight. That's when I got the idea to light a stick on fire. It seemed like these things stayed in the dark at all cost, and perhaps it was the light cast by the fire that was keeping them at bay. I cautiously moved around and grabbed a stick and set it in the fire. After a short while, it eventually ignited, and the flames roared at the end of what was now my torch. I decided to try and see what these things were, so I stuck the torch towards the opening of Ryan and Alyssa's tent. As soon as the flame got close enough to potentially see what the eyes in the tent belonged to, we heard a screeching from within. The tent then ripped itself out of the ground. Whatever was inside of it ran away, taking the tent with it. The tent ended up about ten feet away from us, the shredded fabric in the back of it blowing in the wind. The creature within, long disappearing into the darkness. When that little ordeal was over, Kimmy pointed out that the eyes had stopped swaying. For a few horrifying moments, everything around us was quiet. No cicadas, no wind, nothing. Then, footsteps, a lot of them, from all around us, broke the ear-shattering silence that surrounded us. We all let out a terrified yelp when mine and Kimmy's tent was inexplicably ravaged by something we couldn't see. Whatever it was had moved so fast that we couldn't see what was happening. All of a sudden, our tent was out of the ground and in a state of disarray. I was the first to go. Something swept my feet out from underneath me and I hit the ground so hard it rendered me unconscious. I don't know what happened after that, but from what Ryan and the girls told me, the same thing happened to them, one by one. When I came to, Kimmy, Ryan, and Alyssa were all unconscious. Sunlight seeped through the dense trees above us, and there were no eyes in sight. I noticed immediately that my eyes were very sensitive to the light, and the limited sun was almost blinding. I quickly checked on my wife and my friends to make sure they were all alive, and they were. Each of them had one thing in common, however. 
There were light scratches all around their eyes. I closed my own and touched them and found the area to be very sensitive, which told me I had the same scratches as well. When everyone was awake, we decided to continue heading in the direction we knew the car was in. After no more than a 10 minute walk, we came to an opening in the trees, about 50 yards away from which sat the lot we had parked in. Our car was there, untouched. We all sprinted back to the car and drove the entire way back home, though all of us were having slight vision problems. I'm not really sure what the eyes in the woods were. I don't know what they belonged to. I have no idea what they did to us. What I do know is that the color in my eyes has been slowly fading away, growing lighter and lighter over the past few weeks. The same has been happening to Kimmy, Ryan, and Alyssa. We all got together for the first time since the camping trip yesterday, and there were more similarities between the four of us. We were each very sensitive to any kind of light, and each of us had inexplicably been having the strongest urges to go back into the woods, like something was calling us to them. We're all not sure why, but we think we're going to go back into those woods and stay just a few more nights. Technology is really starting to creep me out. I installed Apple's new operating system, iOS 12, on my iPhone last night. I don't know why I did it so soon. I'm not a technophile or anything like that. Usually, I listen to the reviews and wait around for a major update. But something about that little red setting icon begged to be clicked. Call it curiosity or my incessant need to stay up to date, or just some sort of obsessive compulsive disorder restricted to technical updates. I clicked it. Five minutes to download relayed my illuminated screen. The progress bar ticked away steadily and without issue. My phone still worked fine at the time. I popped back into messages and texted my best friend. It was past midnight, but he always stayed up late. Jason is also an android nerd. The type to turn a conversation about cell phones into a political debate. He sounded eager to talk trash. Let me know when that huge file bricks your old crappy phone, he said. I tried to write back a witty reply, but then my cell phone restarted. The logo appeared on the screen. I tossed it to the side and went back to watching TV while it went through the usual steps of installing a new operating system. After a few minutes, the light turned on, and I picked it back up, entering my password once again. Welcome to iOS 12 flashed across my screen. The new design looked pretty sleek. I clicked through an introductory message that listed out some new features. They improve the ability to edit videos. You can now actually measure objects with your camera. There's a bunch of other cool stuff too. But in the end, the one that really piqued my interest were the... Animojis. For those of you who don't know what that is, I don't blame you. Animojis are puppet-like cartoon characters shared through text message that can be designed to look like the user. Now, with the addition of front-facing cameras, Animojis can react like you, all in real time. I decided to take advantage of this feature by playing a little prank on Jason. I quickly clicked through the options to customize my character. I added a light skin tone with a bunch of freckles, a beard, small nose, small head, and short black hair. My eyes are an unusual shade of blue. So I added that too. I gave him a gray hat to match the one sitting on the rack by my desk and called it a wrap. For a shoddy effort at best, I was somewhat impressed at how closely it resembled me. That corny little cartoon creature could have been my clone. I opened up messages again and studied the camera to record my motions. 
The Animoji responded perfectly. If I opened my mouth to speak, the character did the same. If I batted my eyes, it batted them back. If I stuck out my tongue, it did the same. You get the picture. It was eerie, really. I don't know how this could be considered fun for children. My message for Jason was a pretty childish one. The Animoji also has the unique ability to record your voice. I sung a You Suck melody and shook my character's head back and forth like a rag doll. It was stupid, I know. I tried to make it seem like a rude puppet kind of thing. After a quick review, I sent it over and laughed at the accuracy and my own idiocy. It took a while for Jay to respond. I thought it was weird. We had talked just moments before. This seemed like prime Jason trash-talking material, and he almost never went to sleep. I checked the computer and his status on Facebook still showed as active. I messaged him on it a couple of times and asked if he liked my gift as a joke. He replied to me a minute later. What is with that voice? You get diagnosed with emphysema or something? I can barely hear you, man. His response surprised me. The feature never said anything about modifying my voice. Before I could understand anything, Jay replied again. Okay, I just got the second message. What the actual hell, man? I never told you about that. I stared at the computer screen. Then I looked back at my dimmed phone. I never sent a second message. What are you talking about? I told him. I waited another couple of minutes for a response. Then, Jason came back with a flurry of replies. They all arrived at the same time like a delay of some sort had held him back. Then he signed offline. I thought he had blocked me. Stop sending me these videos. I know it's you. It's your number and it's your damn face. Adam, you're freaking me out. I never told you about my sister. Why are you saying my address? The last message I received was at 1.55 a.m., what is wrong with your voice? I grabbed my phone off the desk and turned it off. I didn't stop to close out the apps or anything like that. I'm not sure if that matters. If someone technical knows more, maybe they can help. In the next half hour, I paced around my room and waited for a reply from Jason that never came. I called his house a thousand times. I even thought about driving over there in the middle of the night. But I didn't. In the end, I chalked the whole situation up to some creepy, reasonable phenomenon. It had to be. Maybe the wires in the cloud got crossed or something. I fell asleep with a cell phone under my pillow and my German Shepherd by my side. I woke up this morning to an incessant vibrating in my ear. The phone must have turned itself back on while I slept. I had several missed calls and two unread texts, but Jason never replied. The messages were from an unknown number. As soon as I opened the dialogue box, the bright blue eyes of my Animoji greeted me with a sardonic grin. I hit play on the video and immediately recognized it as the one I recorded last night. You suck, you suck, you suck. My childish voice chanted. I scrolled down to the next message. The clip played automatically. My Animoji seemed a lot more serious in this shot. It did not move its mouth. First, it tipped its head to the left, curiously. Then it tipped it to the right. It smiled again. Then, 30 seconds in, the character's head continued on its axis until it rotated all the way around to its original point. I felt myself grow nauseous. Something about that movement and the positioning it suggested made me sick. It looked like a scene out of The Exorcist. Human heads and necks are not meant to work like that. How can anyone move in that direction? 
How can anyone replicate it? This feature is brand new. Then, the character spoke. The voice seemed to fit Jason's description pretty well. It sounded as if the male speaker had just finished smoking a carton of cigarettes. He coughed at first. My character reacted accordingly by covering its mouth. Then, it leaned in close to the camera. The character's blue eyes grew wide. Its mouth opened slowly. It enunciated three words alongside a gravelly and unmistakable rusty tone. It said. I immediately closed the app. I'm not sure why, but I had to get out of my apartment. Again, I didn't know enough about technology to know whether this was concerning, but the entire experience shook me. I needed to get out of my head, and I could think of only one way. The drive to Jay's house is only five minutes away. Angry sirens streamed down the block before I even pulled out of my driveway. I told myself that they couldn't be related, yet the voice in the back of my head told me they were. I returned the missed calls during the drive over, two of the calls from the same unknown number, and one from a number I recognized. My mother had called me from home. I dialed her back first, and her tear-choked tone confirmed my absolute worst nightmare. Jason's mother called. They found him in his house. He's dead, Adam. I'm so sorry, she told me. My mom continued to tell me that the killer made an absolute mess of the scene. Blood covering every inch of the house. The front door was splintered in two pieces. She probably didn't mean to say all these things to me, but the words spilled out of her like a horrible disease. As far as she knew, the police didn't have very many leads as to the whereabouts of the killer. I hung up and checked the other missed call. They had left a voicemail. It was the police. Apparently, they had checked Jay's phone and wanted me to come in for some questioning. When I heard that, I quickly turned around and drove back home. I am freaking out right now. I don't know what to do. My only defense is to pin my best friend's death on a goddamned animoji.